If you've been with us for a while in our, in our study through Colossians here, if you, if you haven't noticed, uh, uh, and maybe you have, this book is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Uh, and and that the theme of it is don't allow yourself to be deceived by anyone or anything else. It's like he says, I love the way he puts it in chapter 2 there. If you want to look over there, chapter 2 verse 9. Talking about Jesus now. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And look at verse 10. You are complete in him who is the head of all principality and all power. Wow, that just says it. So we've been looking here in, in chapter 1 there, verse 9 to 18, we see he's describing the absolute preeminence of Jesus Christ. Remember what he said in verse 15 there? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And then he goes on in verse 19 to 23 and points out, he is the one who has reconciled us back to God. He did it. Notice what he said in verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on, on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He reconciled us at the cross at Calvary. And we are now restored to him. And, and we, have, we have now, because of him and what he did for us, we have peace with God and a loving fellowship with him. Brethren, that's called being reconciled. And I like the way he puts it in verse 21 there. And you who were once alienated and enemies by, in your mind by wicked works. Oh, wasn't that all of us? Yet now he has reconciled. Wow. And now regarding this message of reconciliation. Paul says at the end of verse 23. Of which I, Paul, became a minister. And going off of that. You know... There is no higher calling in life for anyone than to share the word of God and the truth of Jesus Christ in this world. Alexander White was a, was a minister of the gospel back around the turn of the century, a hundred years ago. And he once wrote to a, a very discouraged young pastor, he said this, the angels around the throne envy you, your great work. Go on and grow in grace and in power as a gospel preacher. You know, we're all called to different occupations in this life. But I'm telling you, that's for a reason. Because he needs his little light shining in every nook and cranny of this world. And you are that light. Hallelujah. How? How in the world am I that? Because you've been reconciled to him by the power of Jesus Christ and his finished work on Calvary. Done. So... You know, that call to be just his servant, to be a minister of his, supersedes every other reason we are in that place that we find ourselves currently. Do you realize that? Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 5.20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
And, and you can because he did it. And, and, and that's it. You know, that ultimately is the calling. So with this declaration here in Colossians uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord over all creation and that he has saved our souls and he has reconciled us to God, brethren, Paul goes on now and shares his heart for this ministry that God has called him to. And I see in, in verses there, 19 to uh, t- verses 24 to 29, I, I see four aspects of, of that heart of ministry. Uh, we, we see there uh, his attitude about it. And we see secondly, his charge in that ministry. And then thirdly, his purpose. And then fourthly, his commitment to it. We see those four things. And I would say, brethren, that, that may we all glean from Paul that spirit of being a servant of Christ in the, in the context that he has placed our lives. Yeah, pick up that spirit of that call. Look at, look at, as Paul goes on and says, man, he's called me to be a minister of this incredible, wonderful, most wonderful truth in the world. And, and we see his attitude about that. When we pick it up in verse 24, look at it. Verse 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. He said, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. You look at something like this and you go, what is with this guy? Is he some sort of baptized masochist or something like that? Oh, it feels good. Hit me again. No, of course not. You know, for the Christian, follow me now, in Scripture, there is immeasurable good and value that comes out of any and all suffering. You know, that's why he can say in James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Oh, what it can do in your life. What God can do with it. I'm telling you, man, when you're suffering, count it joy. Oh, not that, you know, oh boy, this feels good. I want to do more of this. No, of course not. But what God is going to do with that and is doing with it. Paul said this in Romans chapter 5. He said, I exult in my sufferings. He's not a masochist. He goes on and says, you know why? Because I know what God's doing with it in my life. I know that it is, it is producing in me a patient endurance. And I know it's proven, it, it, it's producing a proven character. And it's given me that, that abiding, wonderful hope that I have in Jesus. It just, it just wells it up in my heart. And not only that, but then the Holy Spirit just gets poured out in my life. And all I can say to that is, wow, glory to God. This is what he's doing through all of that, that suffering. Now, you know, he says this, but he goes on. I think he gives two particular reasons in this context that he is telling them that he rejoices in his sufferings. And the first one are the last two words in that phrase. He says, for you. He says, for you. Notice what he says at the end of verse 24 there. For the sake of his body, which is the church. Other believers. In other words, that his suffering has ended up bringing incredible benefit to the body of Christ. To believers. Oh, you know Paul went through it. You read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 the stuff that guy went through. You know, five times he was whipped, you know, with the 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. One time he was taken up by an angry mob and stoned and left for dead. He was imprisoned. Three times... At sea, the ship sank right from under his feet, you know. He had a, a, a thing about going on a ship after that. <laughs> I'll walk. You guys take the ship. <laughs> but he went through all that. And you know why? You know why? He can say, I rejoice in this. Because it was through all of that that brought the gospel to those people. And he saw countless find salvation through 
the stuff he had been going through. He saw the fruit of it. So, man, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Heard the story not too long ago of a, a Muslim young man. He was totally into it. Uh, he wanted to become, uh, study it and become an, an, an imam, you know, you know, a leader in Islam. And, uh, and his family was very strongly Islamic. It was in Africa. And he just got gloriously saved. He found Jesus Christ and realized Jesus, it's about Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He was so excited. He went back and told his dad whom he loved dearly. And you know, you, you, you don't do things like that. His dad, of course, was absolutely filled with anguish and anger. How could my son, who was going to be in a meme, become a, an accursed, blasphemous Christian? He hired villagers to attack him when he was out there on the trail and kill him, beat him and kill him. So he was on that trail and some of the village guys got together and they hid in the bushes and when he walked by, they jumped out and they beat him to a pulp and left him there to die on that trail. Wouldn't you know, just a little while later, some Christians come along and he's still breathing. And they take him, you know, and nurse him back to him. It, it takes a while, man. That guy was in bad shape. But they nurse him back to health. He comes back to the village. To the village, it was like somebody had been risen from the dead and walked in the village. So you would think they would go, wow. Did they go, wow? They went, wow, in another way. What are we going to do about this guy? You know what they did next? They planned a big feast. Come, enjoy the feast. And they poisoned his meal. Poisoned him with enough poison could kill a horse. He ate that. <clears throat> and I've got to admit in the story, this guy got very sick. Very sick. But once again, he was taken and nursed and survived the poisoning. <coughs> Miraculously survived the poisoning. It's like there couldn't, there's nothing they could do to get rid of this guy. The long and the short of it was eventually dad came to Christ because of his son. Amen. Amen. And so that boy endured a lot of suffering, but I can tell you the way he loved dad, that it was worth it to see his dad come to Christ and know they're going to be united in glory with him. You know, sometimes I wonder in every one of our cases, we who are truly born again of his spirit have received Jesus into our heart. I wonder how much suffering of believers they had to go through that were a part of your coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I wonder. And so Paul says, seeing that picture, Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Boy, I can rejoice on that basis. And then in, 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 he, he goes on and, and he makes this interesting statement there in, in verse 24. He says, and to fill up in my flesh what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Now, this is the second reason. But you look at that and poor people have fun with that little phrase. They're going, what's he saying there? He's saying that when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, it wasn't quite enough. And Paul had to do a little bit more to finish the job. And oh, no way. Jesus said from the cross, it is finished. You know what he meant when he said that? He meant this, it is finished. Mission accomplished. And all through scripture, he says, what he accomplished on the Calvary did the job 100%. Yeah. You're saved by his sacrifice and death and resurrection from Calvary. You are saved on that basis and that basis alone. In fact, he's, you know, he, he says it right here. If you look back there again at verse, 20, verse 19 in chapter 1. It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him were there things on earth or things in heaven. Having made peace through the blood of, the, of his cross. Not through the sufferings of Paul. 
And he goes on, and you once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. He did it all right there. Brethren, it's not Paul saying, I needed to suffer for sins to finish Christ's job. That's not what he's saying. It's not suffering for sins that he's talking about, but he's talking about the sufferings that come through service in his name. Jesus said, if you're going to be a follower of mine, the world's not going to like you. And if they hated me, they'll hate you. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. That's the kind of suffering he's talking about. That word afflictions there in the New Testament is never a reference to Christ's suffering for a sin, for our sins. The word means distress or pressure or, or, or trouble. And of course, Paul had plenty of that. But we are told in Scripture that, that we can, in our walk and lives, expect really nothing less one way or the other. He says, grab this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But you know what? There's a glorious assurance. Absolutely glorious. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, For our light affliction, there's that word, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Wow. You know what scripture says? It is absolute privilege to suffer as a believer. It's a privilege. Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, you know. The last one. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he adds to that one. Blessed are you when you are reviled. All persecuted. All manner of evil is spoken against you in my name. What does he say in that case? Go home and cry? No. He says rejoice and be exceedingly glad. How in the world can you do that? Because great is your reward in heaven. Because they persecuted the prophets. Just like that. So Paul says right there in Philippians. Chapter 1 verse 29. And for you it has been granted. On behalf of Christ. Not only to believe in him. But also to suffer for his sake. Isn't that interesting? That's a privilege. Grant, it's, it, it, it's the granting of a privilege. That's why the apostles, and I think it was Acts chapter 5, when they had been persecuted by the Sanhedrin, walked out, and what does it say? It says they praised God that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Wow. So you would see what Paul's saying here. I rejoice in my sufferings for you and how Christ is using that for his glory. You know, it, it does refer to this as the afflictions of Christ. Interesting. Remember what Jesus said to Paul on the Damascus road, you know, when he was Saul and, 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 and blah, blinding light, and he fell on his face. He was out persecuting Christians, you know, trying to round them up to, for, for execution or prison and whatnot. And, and he's on the flat on the ground and everything, this bright light. And then this voice from heaven says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. You know what? You know what I like about that? He could have laid there and gone, I didn't mean to persecute you. I'm persecuting these fanatical Christians going around there with their little, you know, words and things they're doing and everything. I'm, I'm not, per no, no offense, but I'm getting them. Since says, when you're persecuting them, you're persecuting me. When you're afflicting them, you're afflicting me. So Paul is saying right here, these are the afflictions of Christ. He is with me in this. You know, when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm suffering for his sake, he suffers along with me. 
You know? These are his afflictions as well as my afflictions. In fact, he goes on to, you know, and a little bit later on, it tells uh, this fellow Ananias in Damascus, he says, I must tell him, I must explain to him all the suffering that he's going to have to go through for my name's sake. But the point about it is he wouldn't just have to go through it alone. He would go through it and Jesus would go through it with him and that would change everything. And that would make it something that was that was granted to him and, and, and worthy and something to rejoice in because Jesus was going through it with him. And you know, he says, the word makes it so clear. When, when these things happen to you, it, it makes your relationship with him more personal and closer and richer. It, it has that effect. And he gives a beautiful example of that in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. He threw him in the furnace. Man, if God was real, real, he wouldn't have let me go into that furnace. If God was powerful, he would have delivered me from the furnace. And God threw him right in the furnace. Allowed him to be thrown right in the furnace. Where are you when I need you, God? You ever felt that way? But what happened? Nebuchadnezzar looks in there, and there's not three in there, there's four. And he says, one looks like the Son of God. You know? Fellowship closeness with him in that David the psalmist of Israel <laughs> you know the psalm 23 yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil how can you say that <sighs> because you are with me you're with me in this and so and so, no wonder, brethren, Paul in, in Philippians 3.10, with all that in mind, in Philippians 3.10, he says, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Christian, you belong to him. He has reconciled you to him. You didn't come knocking at his door hoping he would. He reached out, took you, and reconciled you to himself. It was all his doing. And all you're doing is going, thank you. Thank you. And so now, he says, I've got you. I've got you. Fear not suffering. Whatever it is, fear not suffering. I've got you. And you know what I like about that statement Paul makes? He says there very implicitly, and fill up in my flesh. And fill up in my flesh. You know what that says? That says this suffering is never just arbitrary. It's never, it's, here we go again. Slam bang. But it is ordained by God. It is, it is something that God in his sovereignty is carefully watching over. And, and the administration of it is under his sovereign authority ordained by him. And no more than that. No more than that. Now, only that which will work out for good, for your good, and for his glory, and for the benefit of other people. That's, that's, that's all he'll allow. That's, you know, this, this fill it up and that's it. You're not, not overflowing, you know. And so, brethren, when we get to heaven, believe me, believe me, maybe you do a lot of complaining this side of glory. But you won't do any up there. And you will look at all of these things and all the suffering you had to endure. And you will praise God and give thanks for every bit of it. You will thank him for it. You know what? couple things. One, you'll see how productive it all was. How productive it was in your life and the life of other people around you. And what God did with that, you know. And it'll just, glory to God. Hit me again. Glory to God. You know? And secondly, you'll see his protective grace 
through them all. His grace is right there. He's not letting go. He's holding on. He's governing. He's limiting. He's got a hedge around this. He's being, he's getting you through, you know, with his, with his protective grace all around you. <laughs> so this is Paul's attitude about being out there for him. An attitude in his ministry. His serving Jesus isn't a bowl of cherries. But he says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of the body, which is the church. I rejoice in how my hanging in there and carrying on with you through all of that stuff, how it has helped so many others. I thank you. That's his attitude about ministry. And then he, and then he talks about his charge in that ministry. The charge he senses, verse 25. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God. Which was given to me for you. To fulfill the word of God. God's put me on this path that, I, that I'm on. And I just want to fulfill God's plan and God's purpose in this. And he describes it in this way. To fulfill the word of God. You know, that speaks to me. Literally, it's what it's saying is that I might complete the word of God. The idea and the spirit of it is that I might lay out the word of God fully. That I might just lay it out to you. You know, that, that speaks to me. That speaks to me as a pastor. There are two kinds of preaching out there. One is topical preaching. And the other is expositional where, 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 where you're just verse by verse. You're, you're, just, you're just teaching the word. Topical teaching is the most prevalent out there. Most churches you go to will teach topically. You know? And there's a place for topical teaching. I mean, it's taking scriptures and kind of put, putting together, you know, a, a teaching on a particular topic from God's word, you know. But here's the thing about a steady diet of topical preaching. You're only going to hear what the preacher wants to preach about. And he has his favorite little things he likes to preach about, and that's what you're going to hear about. And there's things maybe he's uncomfortable with. You'll never, never hear about that. You won't hear about those. Maybe there's things he doesn't feel well, very well versed on. And so he'll avoid that. And he'll preach kind of on what he wants to preach on. And so most topical preaching when you're out there, you're going to hear some very, very wonderful biblically based sermons. That was good. I wonder how much you're going to hear about the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood shed for you. I wonder how much you're ever going to hear about hell. And I'll tell you something else. I doubt if you'll hear much of anything at all about Revelation. Last book of the Bible. Only book in the Bible which offers a blessing to those who will read it. Now here's the thing about expositional preaching. You're giving them the whole counsel of God. Through a book. You're giving what God has to say in the context God put it. And when you're faithful to that, you hit the topics. You hit the ones maybe you're not too comfortable with. You hit the ones maybe that are kind of hard to preach once in a while. But the people need to hear them. You know? And, and you're getting, you're getting, you're not being taught from the Bible. You're being taught the Bible. And, and Paul, that was... You know, that, that was his theme of ministry. He said in Acts 20, 27 to the elders at Ephesus, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I wanted you to get a, a well-rounded understanding from the Lord. And this is why I've, brethren, I've, I've committed my life to do this. I believe this is the best thing I can do for you. Is to give you the word of God. In its full, fullness and completeness. So, so, so Paul says there, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. 
And then he goes on and explains kind of the heart and the essence of that preaching ministry when he says in verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Oh, this mystery. He talks about that. This is not a Sherlock Holmes kind of a mystery. In the New Testament, that word mystery means something that has been hidden in past generations, which is now being revealed. In fact, if you want to look back just a little bit, just a few pages in your Bible, and look at Ephesians chapter 3, he, he describes that mystery and what it is in, in chapter, chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 2. Look at this. Listen to this. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he may know to me, there it is, the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit that's the Holy Spirit, to his holy apostles and prophets. Here it is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God which was given to me by the effecting working of his power. He called me to this. But you see, he's saying those Old Testament uh, prophets the fellows even were, you know, wrote some of those books in the Old Testament where prophets of God didn't really understand what God was going to do. They, they, they didn't see in their own writings and prophecies a suffering Messiah. Suffering for our sin. They just saw this glorious king coming to, you know, take over the world. And they didn't understand that God was going to save, are you kidding me, Gentiles. Oh, those people are creeps. I mean, you know what, what the average thinking was? That you know why God had Gentiles? To keep the fires of hell burning. Fodder for the vials of hell. Let's keep stoking the fire. Send the Gentiles in there. You know? Even the angels, the Bible said, didn't understand how God was going to pull this off. That's the mystery. And he did it through Jesus. And all you have to do is receive him as your Lord and your Savior. And you're made new in him. The glory, that glorious mystery is now being revealed in believers. And through believers. And here's what he has to say about that. Verse 27. To them God willed to these believers, to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's a mind blower. That is an absolute mind blower. Christ in you. I mean, in the, you know, it's not just being an example to you. It's not, it, it's not simply uh, telling you what, what you ought to be doing. But we fall so far short that he has come and not only forgiven us all of our sin. Past, present, and future. And not only saved us eternally and reconciled us to God. But he comes in and he is in you. He is in you. That's why a little child can receive Jesus into his or her heart. He comes in and takes up residence there. What does that mean? What in the world does that mean? That means the righteousness of God himself abides in you. Hey, there's the righteousness of God. Because Christ is the righteousness of God. And he is in you. And so, and so God looks there and what does he see? He sees the righteousness of God. You're saved. Get any more saved than that. And not only that, you know what he sees in Christ in you? The power of God. The wonder and the power of God abides in there. And God can do whatever he wants through that vessel. Because Christ is in you and the power of God abides in you. And all you have to do is be available to him. Be available. 
and then, and then see what God can do through you. I mean, that, it just, that right there, Christ in you, availability, makes you uh, uh, something that is usable to God, someone that's usable to God under any and all circumstances. So, brethren, I think one of the, one of the wiles of the enemy is trying to put a, a, a veil over our heads that we do not understand and we, not unappre- we, we don't, do not appreciate the power of God that can be manifested through a simple prayer. Through, through a word fitly spoken. Through a deed done. Because Christ is in you. So, and he, he, he says, you know what the really, really, real cool thing about that? The really, really off the charts cool thing about that? Christ in you is the hope of glory. And when he says hope in the Bible, you know, absolute certainty. A 100% assurance. Done deal. So Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 a finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. He's in prison here and he knows that his number is going to be up real soon. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. But not to me only, but also to A-L-L all who have loved his appearing. You feel in your heart, oh Lord, come. <laughs> you're, in the, you're, in, you're in the gang. You're in. So brethren, Paul says, this is what I'm here for. This is my charge. Do you realize, do you realize, ultimate, finally, when all is said and done, that's what we're here for? You know, just to be his instrument along this line. We used to sing it in Sunday school, didn't we? This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Join me. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. When? All the time. All the time. You know, that's the charge. It's a good one. And then his purpose. Verse 28. Purpose of all this. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. That's, that's what I'm what I want to, doing this for. I, I want to see you. I want to see brethren uh, perfect. The idea is ma- complete and mature and full-grown Christians. You know, just embracing the fullness of this in your own life, you know. Uh, Paul put it this way in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. I can't tell you as a pastor, I look at these faces out here Sunday by Sunday. And I can't tell you how much I desire to see your face in glory with him. You know? Like joy. So, so that's, that's, that's his purpose in all of this. And then how's he going about it? Notice what he said there. He said three things in that verse. Him we preach. I'm pointing to Jesus. I'm telling you about Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. I'm preaching Jesus Christ. I'm proclaiming him as Lord and Savior. It's all about Jesus. The answer here is, the answer is, you want to hear the answer? It's Jesus. Get it? It's Jesus. Nothing less. And then he says, he goes, he says I'm, him we proclaim, warning every man. Warning, admonishing is the idea there. Listen, Paul did not shrink from that unpleasant task of admonishment once in a while. No fun. You know, Sometimes you can give an honest and a a God-appointed admonishment to somebody. You're not getting on their case. You're doing it because you love them. 
You say, wait, stop. No. And they can resent that. They can get angry about it. They can tell you off to your face and stomp off. I don't want to hear it. I'll tell you who the really nice and good people are. They're the gang I go down and, and wallow with in the gutter. They're the nice ones. You're mean. But I'll tell you something. So often, that ends up really helping them in the future. This is a few years ago. When I tell you the story, you'll understand. It must have been a few years ago. Big church down in the Bay Area found out that one of their staff people was a, a practicing homosexual. They say, no, that's an abomination to God. And they went to this person and they confronted him and they called him to repentance. Well, he got upset. He got angry. He's, no way. You know what Jesus said? If a person in the body will not respond to to, you know, the call of the body to repentance. Jesus said, treat him like a heathen or a tax collector. And so they disfellowshipped him. And he went off angry. Two years later, they got a letter from him. And that letter was, thank you so much for being bold and brave enough to do that to me. That's what I needed. And it has led to the salvation of my soul. And so I thank you for doing that. I know what I just said is not politically correct. I think California even has made a law now against me doing that. But I'm going to speak the truth. <laughs> yeah. Amen. <clears throat> but you see, God can use... A word fitly spoken, which may be a warning or an admonition to somebody. And Paul was not afraid to do that when he saw this is what they need. Look what they're doing. Look where they're going. This is what they need. I'm going to do it. And they may not receive it, but I'm going to do it. You know? And then he said, he, he goes on and he says, that was the second. And the third thing is teaching every man. Teaching every man in all wisdom. Giving them the word. Giving them the word any which way you can. The word, you know. That's the teaching. Paul said in, in Acts 20.20, 20, For I have kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. He said, anywhere I could, any way I could. I wanted to share the word of God with you. And you know why? Because the power is in the Word of God. It's not in my persuasive words of wisdom. It's, it's, it's in the Word of God itself. That's where the power is. Most of you know the story of Mutiny on the Bounty. Probably many of you saw the movie. Maybe some of you have even read the book. Famous book. True story. Mutiny on the Bounty. You know, it's when that what, wicked Captain Bly, they finally said, well, Enough! And they put him in a little rowboat and, and it, with the first officer and some others and they just sent him off. And they had mutineered and they had took this ship called the Bounty and they went over to Tahiti and they got a bunch of, you know, some guys and gals, Tahitian guys and gals and then they went out and there were nine of them that took the ship and looked around and they found this little island called Pitcairn Island. Pitcairn Island. It, it's just a little dot in the South Pacific all by itself. It's, it's an island that's two miles long and one mile wide, okay? And they, 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 they settled there. Well, in about a 10-year period of time, through a lot of alcohol and a lot of fighting, there was only one man left. There were 11 women and 23 children, but one man. And that's where the story usually ends, you know, mutiny and the bounty. But like Paul Harvey used to say, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. And it's even greater than that story. 
because John Adams right around that time was rummaging through some old bounty stuff and he found deep in a locker the Bible that belonged to the ship, the ship's Bible, the bounty. And he took that Bible and he began to read it. And reading God's word and everything began to transform his heart. And then suddenly through the word, just reading the word of God, suddenly this old cranky murderer had an incredible, miraculous change of heart and became a different man. And the, uh, the, the peace and the love that, that he found in there made him a new man. And he went and he started teaching these children from the Bible. And over a period of time, everyone on that island experienced that same change of their heart and life that God's word brought. The entire group became truly born of his spirit Christians through the word. I understand, this is what I understand, that today the descendants number a little bit less than a hundred and every one of them is a Christian. And so Paul says, I'm going to do everything I can to give you the word. <laughs> you know, because it's the word that has the power. And so with that, that's his purpose. And we come to his commitment here. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Verse 29, we wrap it up with this. To this end. I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Boy, two powerful words, labor and striving. Labor carries the idea of just, just put to the point of exhaustion, working. And that striving, uh, agonizamo, we get our word agony from it. And it really is used in the sense of, 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 of the striving and the agony that goes on in an athletic contest. And Paul says, this is my heart and this is my passion and this is my commitment to, you know, to this wonderful, wonderful work of being a, a minister of, of Jesus Christ. However, he would allow me to do that. And the, it just, you know what the spirit of that is? Every opportunity that comes along, whenever it is and wherever it is, Lord, I just want to, I want to be yours. But the, the key, the, the assuredness in that is that last phrase, where he says, according to his working, which works in me mightily. He says, I'm out there. And you know what makes this thing exciting? It's when I see that it, it's not me. It's not me at all. It, it's his working. He's doing something here according to his work and his power, which, which works through me, man. And that is just the coolest thing in the world to be a part of. That's, that's his spirit in this whole thing. So it's all about not what you can do, but what he can do and what he has done. All we have to offer him is what, what he's done in us and what he can do through us. So whether a pastor, whether a Sunday school teacher, whether a parent, a witness, the only impact that's going to happen is going to be his working which works in you. And may it be mightily. His power, his doing. Not yours. That takes the pressure off. Close with a little story. Africa. The area that was formerly French West Africa. A lot of the people speak French in that area. Um, little a little old African lady came to Christ, was so grateful for Jesus saving her. She wanted to just, she wanted to serve him. She wanted to do something to show her thankfulness. And one day she came to the missionary and she brought a French Bible. This lady was blind. She was uneducated. She didn't even know how to read. And she was 70 years old. And she came to, with this French Bible. And she said to the, to the missionary, would you open up the John 3.16 and underline it in red ink? And the missionary goes, okay. Doesn't know what this is about. Underlined it in red ink. You know what she did? She went down each day to this, this boys' school and sat out in front of that school. And when the boys were coming out, 
she would kind of call out, does anyone here know how to read French? And of course, the boys are going, oh, they were proud of that. Oh, I can read French. Would you come here and help me? And they would walk over and she would open it. Would you find this, this where, where it's underlined here? Would you read that to me? And they would read John 3.16. And then she'd say, do you know what that means? And she would share Jesus with them. And she just, just did this. And apparently she did it for years. Out of that simple little ministry, 24 young men became pastors of the gospel of Jesus Christ. From that ministry. Listen, listen. This little 70-year-old blind, uh, uneducated, not ignorant, uneducated lady <clears throat> had it all. She had a ministerial attitude. She had a ministerial purpose. You know, she had a ministerial heart. And whatever I said, you know. He had those points. They were, all, they were all in her, you know. It was her commitment. And brethren, 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 the privilege, realizing what we're really here for, of being the instrument of God's in this world, in these last days. Amen. My heart is, oh no, what do I have to do now? Is just, Lord, how would you like to use the likes of me? Where I happen to be at this time. And I want to be your instrument. I just want to be your instrument. And look to him to take it from there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for the heart of Paul for ministry. And Lord, how it ministers the simplicity and the life that is in and through Jesus Christ to us. There are folks here that need to take that and apply it in their own homes with their spouse, with their children with their family, on their jobs, in the marketplace, in the neighborhood. Oh, Lord, Lord, this little light of mine, let it shine. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.